Roy Simpson, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Gethsemane River College in Sacramento, California. This is another proof in my Proofs in Differential Calculus series. This proof is for the theorem, Fermat's theorem. Actually, this is really Fermat's little theorem, not just Fermat's theorem. Uh, Fermat's theorem in advanced mathematics is a totally different theorem. However, in first year calculus or differential calculus, Fermat's theorem generally refers to this. So we have a function, either it has a local max or a local minimum at a point, and we know that the derivative exists at that point. That implies that the derivative at that point must be zero. Now, before I even go into talking about what's required for this proof, I want to mention something that's often a point of confusion for students. They often think that the converse of this is true, however, it is not. F prime is C being zero does not necessarily imply that the function value at C is a local extremum. So this is uh, this is just a confusing point. A lot of people, a lot of students, when they're first introduced to Fermat's theorem, feel as though, yeah, okay, so if the derivative at, let's say, 7 is 0, that means it's a local max or min. That's not true. The derivative being 0 does not necessarily imply that. A simple example is y equals x squared. That's, a, that's the traditional uh, calculus example. y equals, I'm sorry, x cubed. Sorry about that. y equals x cubed is the traditional calculus example. This actually has um, at 0, x equals 0, the derivative of this function is 0. However, at 0, that's not a local max, nor is it a local min. So that's just something to note. Okay. Now speaking of local maxes and local mins, stuff like that, we should probably talk about what is required knowledge for this proof. Here are the items. You have to know the definition of a local max and a local min, and specifically we're going to tackle uh, the maximum. So I'm just going to deal with one half of this proof. Uh, so you'll have to know the definition of a local max. So in calculus, f having a local maximum at a point c is true if f of c is greater than or equal to, which is a weird thing, but greater than or equal to f of x for all x in some delta neighborhood about c. So, um, and this is important enough that I, I just want to kind of show you this in a picture. So we have some graph that somebody gave us, and this graph is a graph of a function f, and we are claiming that when we plug in c, f of c is a local maximum, which it sure certainly looks like it is. And so uh, what this theorem is saying is that we have to have a uh, delta neighborhood, so just a small neighborhood about c, such that any input that we plug in from that neighborhood, so any of these x values that we plug in, lead to outputs that are lower than or equal to, in height, f of c. So all these outputs have to be uh, less than or equal to f of c. Uh, that or equal to is always a point of contention with me, but it is actually true. That's the way it's defined for a local max or, again, for a local min if you swap the inequality. All right. Uh, another thing that is somewhat of a, a confusing thing about local maxes and local minimums is that um, because f of c has to be greater than or equal to f of x for local minimums uh, for all x in a delta neighborhood about c, we are assuming that the function is defined on either side of c. So you have to have the function existing in an interval about c. So uh, that way endpoints are not fair game. So getting back to what we need to be doing, uh, you'll also need to know the definition of derivative. Uh, we are going to be using the squeeze theorem a little bit, and a little bit, you can't just use it a little bit. We're using squeeze, squeeze theorem, and uh, you also have to know the definition of absolute value, at least the uh, piecewise defined function uh, version of it. That's what I'm going to use in the proof. Speaking of the proof, let's get back into it right now. Let's go ahead and start the proof out. Um, and what we're going to do is we have to assume what we're uh, given. So we have an assumption here that f is, has a local, and again, like I said, we're dealing with the local maximum. I'm just going to prove that for the local maximum. So we'll assume that f has a local maximum at c and that f prime at c exists. So let's go ahead and write that down. We're also going to go ahead and I like to kind of give a... Um, Kind of in a lighter pen stroke down in the bottom right, I'm going to just state where I want to go. I want that um, f prime at c is equal to zero. And there's a couple things that might help me here, so this will be my scratch here. That will imply that the limit as h approaches zero of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h 
should equal zero as well. I'm just putting that in there because that's a limit definition of a derivative. And uh, usually uh, when you're doing a proof that involves uh, limits or, or derivatives, you're going to have to use the limit definition of a derivative. So I'm just putting those two down there. Those are the things that I want. And we also happen to know that that limit as h approaches zero of f of c plus h minus f of c over h actually exists because we said f prime at c does exist. We just don't know the value of it yet. We're trying to prove that it's zero. So we definitely know that limit exists. Now let's say something about the fact that we have a local maximum at c. Then we happen to know that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in that delta neighborhood centered at c. And for some delta, right? So some there's some delta neighborhood that exists centered, uh, such that when you center it at c, um, it's all the inputs lead to outputs that are less than or equal to uh, f of c itself. Now we're going to go ahead, I want to introduce an h because that's where I want to go with this. So I'm going to go ahead and let just pick a value for h that's smaller than our delta. So I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, I want to pick an h that has absolute size less than delta. So I'm within, uh, well, it's less than delta, but positive. Therefore, f of c must be greater than or equal to f of c plus h. Now let me actually justify this because some people might have a hard time visualizing what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> Since I'm picking an h value that has magnitude, h might be positive, it might be negative, but it has a, a magnitude, a size that's less than delta, that means that when it's a wiggle, it's a very small wiggle, so when I wiggle away from c by this value of h, I'm still within my delta neighborhood. Since I'm within that delta neighborhood, then this f of c plus h, that c plus h is one of those x values in the delta neighborhood, so f of c plus h still has to be less than f of c. Visually, it looks like the following. I'm just back to the previous page we were working on, and I have this exploded view of uh, the graph that I put up before, and basically what we did is we said, you know what, I have a little wiggle, this is this value, that value in red right there, is c plus h if h is positive, if h was negative, then this would be c plus h, okay, so if h is positive, you're wiggling to the right, if h is negative, you're wiggling to the left, but still, we're within our delta neighborhood, therefore, our f of c plus h is still below f of c. Okay, so that's a good visual of what's going on. Now obviously you might not know why I did that. I'll tell you right now, I made that move because I knew I wanted f of c plus h from this guy right down here, and I definitely want to subtract from that an f of c. So if I go ahead and do that um, right now, we'll get the following inequality. And I want to divide this by h, but I'm not going to actually divide it by h. What I'm going to divide it by is the magnitude of h, the absolute value of h, because I don't want to switch the inequality yet. So what I'm going to do is divide both sides by the absolute value of h, which will totally imply that 0 is greater than or equal to that fraction. Now this is where I'm going to do a little bit of work here. I'm going to take the limit of both sides as h approaches 0. Of course, uh, when I do that, you'll notice that in our definition of a derivative that's at the bottom of the page, right down here, let me highlight that, that I don't have an absolute value of h at the bottom. So we're going to have to do kind of a left and a right hand limit thing. That's from the definition of an absolute value, but we'll get to that. Uh, let's go ahead and at first just say that we're going to go ahead and take the limit uh, as h approaches zero of both sides. And, and we can totally do this because we were told this limit in, that's highlighted here actually exists. So we're totally fine doing this. So the limit as h approaches zero of the left hand side must be greater than or equal to the limit as h approaches zero of the right hand side, which is f of c plus h minus f of c all over the absolute value of h. Now because that has an absolute value and because h is approaching zero, which would, which is kind of where uh, the absolute value could be either positive or negative, right? You could be either on the positive side of zero or the negative side of zero. We'll have to split it into two cases. You know, by the way, the left-hand side is just equal to zero, so we don't have to worry about that. So we'll have to split the right-hand side. Here are two cases. Either h is positive 
or h is negative. If h is positive, well, the left-hand side of this inequality is still 0. It's greater than or equal to. Uh, the limit as h approaches 0 from above, because it's positive, uh, of f of c plus h minus f of c all over. And if h is positive, then the absolute value of h is just h itself. Now, we happen to know that this limit is a fancy look for the derivative. It's just f prime at c. And some people will say, but wait a second, that's the uh, right-hand limit. And the derivative is defined not as a right-hand nor as a left-hand, but as a limit as h approaches 0. Well, because the limit exists as h approaches 0, then the left and right-hand limits must be exactly the same. But I'm still going to be a little uh, more exact with this proof. So let's take the case where h is less than 0. Well, again, we happen to know 0 is greater than or equal to, I'm just copying this up here, the limit as h approaches 0, but this time from below, of f of c plus h minus f of c all over. Well, the absolute value of h when h is negative would be the opposite of h, right? That's from the definition of an absolute value. You should know that, that the absolute value of a number is equal to either the number itself if the number is positive. Otherwise, it's the opposite of the number if the number is negative. Okay, so that's exactly what we did. Now, I can factor this negative out and divide both sides by it. If I do that, it implies that 0 is less than or equal to the limit, again, as h approaches 0 from below, of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h. And again, this limit is just a fancy version of f prime at c, but it's a limit. And we have a limit that's bounded below and above by 0. That is, I scroll down a little bit just to kind of get this last little bit in here. That is, we have a limit that is supposed to equal f prime at c, right? And we have one that's uh, the limit as h is approaching 0 from below of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h. And we know that's supposed to be, according to uh, this case right here, greater than or equal to 0. However, f prime of c also equals the limit as h approaches 0 from above of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h. And we have just shown over here that that is less than or equal to 0. By the squeeze theorem, f prime at c has to actually be 0. So there you have it. We've used every little bit of prerequisite knowledge that I said we would need. And thus, Fermat's baby or little theorem is true. Music, take me out.